Hi, I'm Alvisha Damala, and I'm a postdoc at Yale University in the Holmes Lab. And today I'm going to be talking about how we can leverage machine learning and neuroimaging to capture population specific brain behavior relationships. White matter fibers in the brain directly and indirectly connect different brain regions. And these structural connections facilitate the flow of neural activation signals between brain regions. These structural and functional properties of the brain underlie our individual behaviors. In recent years, there's a lot of studies that have looked at how variations in brain structure, activation, and connectivity are associated with neurological and psychiatric illness and behavioral traits. Traditionally, these relationships have been studied at a group level to identify differences between populations, such as healthy and patient groups, males and females, or children and adults. These analyses have led to monumental advances in our understanding of the structural and functional correlates of illnesses and behaviors. But with increased access to computational resources and large publicly available data sets, we can now implement data-driven machine learning predictive models to better understand these relationships at an individual level. In doing so, we can better predict illness risk, disease progression, and even response to treatment for each individual. However, when developing these models, there are many different methodological choices that must be considered because they can directly or indirectly affect the model performance and interpretability. Some of these considerations include the neuroimaging modality and the state that we choose to base our predictions on, the parcellations we use, how we transform our data, how many subjects we include, whether we include population specific or general models, the algorithms that we use, and finally the phenotypes that we're seeking to predict. While there's a lot that can be said about each of these choices, today I'm going to focus on population specific modeling. So when developing models to study brain behavior relationships at an individual level, we can rely on models that consider our entire population or data set to understand the broad relationships that exist. Or we can develop models that are specific to different groups within our population to get more personalized predictions. So these could be models specific to a diagnosis or in my case, specific to different sexes and age groups. And specifically by doing so, we can understand whether these brain behavior relationships we're studying are shared or distinct across ages and sexes. So I'll be presenting results from two different studies today. In the first, we looked at how functional connectivity is related to cognition and whether those relationships are shared across the sexes. In the second one, we looked at how neuroanatomy is related to cognition and whether those relationships are shared or unique across the sexes and across children and adults. And before I dive into that, I'll just quickly go through some background. So in my earlier work, I've looked at how well functional, structural, and a hybrid connectivity combining both structure and function can predict individual cognitive abilities. So here we have the different cognitive scores um, and the explained variance for the models. And models with the, the colored in violin plots indicate that they perform better than chance, whereas the other ones are models that did not perform better than chance. So we found that functional and hybrid connectivity are always able to predict cognition better than chance, whereas that's not the case with structural connectivity. In other words, functional connectivity is generally able to better predict cognition compared to structural connectivity. And integrating the two into a hybrid connectivity doesn't actually increase the prediction accuracy beyond what we already see with functional connectivity. In more recent work, we've replicated these findings. Specifically, we've looked at predictions of cognition, personality, and emotional traits based on anatomical features, track-based features, and functional and structural connectivity. And here we're plotting the correlation between true and predicted for predictions across these different domains. And we've shown that while neuroanatomical properties are not nearly as predictive as functional connectivity features, they are still able to capture individual differences in behaviors in both adults from the HCP dataset and children from the ABCD dataset. Again, replicating our previous findings, functional connectivity predictions are the highest performing ones, but the other ones are still able to capture meaningful differences in behaviors. Other work has demonstrated that the degree of interregional similarity of morphometric features, including gray matter structure, myelination, and curvature is associated with IQ. Specifically, they've reported that crystallized or language abilities and fluid or executive function abilities are uniquely related to patterns of brain morphometry. 
So based on these works, we know there exist underlying relationships between brain structure and function and behavior. But are these relationships shared across age groups or sexes? Well, to answer that question, we need to first consider that throughout our lives, our brain is constantly changing in terms of the volume, surface area, and cortical thickness. So cortical thickness, shown here in purple, rapidly increases before birth, peaks in early childhood, and then gradually decreases throughout the lifespan. Total cerebral volume, shown in red, increases quite a bit until early adolescence, then begins to slowly decline. Finally, surface area in green, also increases until adolescence before slowly declining. So this suggests that if there are underlying relationships between anatomical properties and cognition, they must also be changing in line with these trajectories. To make things even more complicated, these changes in neuroanatomy also differ between the sexes. Males have larger volumes than females in terms of gray matter, white matter, subcortical gray matter, and ventricular volume. So this suggests that any relationships that exist between anatomy and behavior might also be sex-specific. So diving deeper into this aspect of sex and the application of sex-specific models, this study looked at whether cognitive abilities were differentially predictable in males and females based on functional connectivity. So they found that female IQ might be more predictable than male IQ based on functional connectivity. And here they're specifically showing the correlation between the, the true and predicted values and that it is higher in females than it is in males. The same study also looked at the specific neural correlates of cognition based on these models. And here they're showing the connections that were important in females on the left, males on the right, and an overview of those connections across the two sexes in the circle plot. And what they're showing is that the connections in red are those were, that were important for females, the ones in blue are for males, and the only connections in black, the three connections, are the ones that are shared between the sexes. So this suggests that males and females have unique associations between connectivity and cognition. So this sort of led me to my first study, which was part of my graduate work, where we evaluated sex-independent and sex-specific relationships between functional connectivity and individual cognitive abilities. So for each of the 392 healthy young adults that we had from the Human Connectome Project, we computed their functional connectivity using a 439 region COCO atlas, which includes cortical, subcortical, and cerebellar regions. And for each subject, we also had their cognitive composite scores. So this included total, crisp size, and fluid composite scores, as well as their individual task scores within those domains. And we used sex-independent and sex-specific linear regression models to predict the cognitive scores based on their functional connectivity. So we started off with our entire data set, split it into males and females, and then split each of those sex-specific subsets into training and testing sets. We concatenated the male and female training sets for the sex-independent models and kept them separate for the sex-specific models. Then we performed nested cross-validation, and once we had a final model that was optimized, that model was fit on the entire training set, either sex specific or sex independent, and then evaluated across both sexes. So diving into our results, first we looked at the extent to which sex independent models or models trained on both sexes were able to predict the cognitive composite scores and the individual task scores. So here we have the different cognitive scores um, along the x-axis and their prediction accuracy. So the correlation between true and predicted scores on the y-axis. And we're showing the results from the models being tested on males in blue and tested on females in pink. And again, colored and violin plots indicate that they perform better than chance. So overall, we found that the total composite cognition score is equally predictable in males and females, as is the crystallized composite, as well as generally the crystallized specific scores. But fluid abilities are only accurately predicted in males, if at all, and not in females. Looking at the sex-specific models, again, we have the cognitive scores along the bottom, prediction accuracy on the y-axis, and here we have male-trained, male-tested results in purple, male-trained, female-tested in blue, female-trained, male-tested in green, and female-trained, female-tested in orange. So here we see that the total cognition is again equally predictable in both males and females using both the male and female-trained models. The same is also generally true for crystallized abilities, but the models generally fail to predict fluid abilities altogether. So this suggests that the total and crystallized models must be capturing some sort of shared aspect between male and female relationships in 
um, functional connectivity and cognition, whereas for fluid abilities, they're not really capturing any meaningful relationships overall. And if we look at the functional connections that are positively and negatively associated with cognitive abilities, we see that functional connections between visual, dorsal attention, ventral attention, and temporal parietal networks are associated with better crystallized and fluid abilities. On the other hand, functional connections within visual, somatomotor, and temporal parietal networks are associated with weaker crystallized and fluid abilities. And although there are slight differences in the strengths of these associations between the sexes, the general trend is observed is consistent, suggesting that the brain behavior relationships are conserved across males and females. So this is just a quick summary of that work. And this brings me to my current work, looking at how properties of brain structure relate to cognition across the sexes and across children and adults. So in this study, we relied on two large scale data sets from the Human Connectome Project. We had data from 1,013 young adults and from the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development data set, we had 1,823 children and adolescents. For all the subjects, we again had their composite cognitive scores as well as the individual task scores. And using the structural scans from these participants, we extracted surface area, gray matter volume and cortical thickness for 400 cortical parcels based on the Schaefer parcellation. Once again, we use linear ridge regression models to predict the cognitive scores based on surface area, gray matter volume, and cortical thickness. And we had, again, the sex independent and sex specific models. And once optimized, the models were evaluated across both sexes and both data sets. Now, before I get too deep into the results, I do want to say that one of the main goals of this study was actually to look at how correcting for intracranial volume differences affected these predictions overall. Um, I'm not going to focus on those results today, but if you are interested, I encourage you to check out our poster on this topic, as well as a preprint that I have linked at the end of this talk. So based on the overall um, predictions that we ran, we see that surface area, gray matter volume, and cortical thickness can successfully predict cognition in adults. Similarly, these predictions are also significant in children. And all of these results that I'm showing here are also the sex independent models because we do see that the results were replicated independently in males and females, and there weren't really any differences between the sex independent and the sex specific predictions. We then looked at the actual feature weights from the models and the networks that were implicated in these relationships. So here we have the networks organized from um, heteromodal on the left to unimodal on the right. And we see that surface area of visual networks and gray matter volume of default mode language and control networks are associated with cognition in adults. In children, we see that the surface area of default mode and somatomotor networks, as well as gray matter volume of visual, somatomotor and dorsal attention networks are associated with cognition in children. But where it gets really interesting is with cortical thickness. So we actually see that there are opposing gradients for adults and children's for these associations between cortical thickness and cognition. In adults, heteromodal association networks are the most important, whereas in children, unimodal sensory networks are the most important. And these specific brain behavior relationships that we capture and the unique patterns they exhibit in adults and children are in line with prior work demonstrating nonlinear maturation trajectories for cortical development. So typically, if you look at um, cortical expansion, cortical thinning, myelination, functional maturation, or even structure function coupling across the brain, we see that unimodal somatomotor networks achieve maturity earlier, followed by heteromodal association cortices that mature later. So this seems that that pattern of nonlinear development also exists for relationships between cortical thickness and cognition. So this is just a quick summary of our work. And traditionally, in a lot of neuroimaging analyses, we have resorted to regressing out the effects of sex, age, and or other demographic variables. But it's important to realize that a lot of times those variables are strongly related to both the neuroimaging phenotypes that we're interested in, as well as the behavioral side. So regressing out these effects is likely to result in a loss of valuable information. If we instead use population specific models, we can gain insight into how these brain behavior relationships actually vary across different populations. So while general prediction models can capture shared neural correlates of different behaviors, 
population specific models can provide complementary information about the unique brain behavior relationships that exist in different groups. And with that, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank my mentor, Avram Holmes, and the entire Holmes Lab, our collaborator, Thomas Yeo, and the Computational Brain Imaging Group, as well as Amy Kusieski and the entire Computational Connectomics Lab, who were part of the first study that I presented. And the first study that I presented was recently published in Human Brain Mapping, if you'd like to check it out. And if you'd like to learn more about the second study and how correcting for intracranial volume biases those predictions and their interpretations, I encourage you to check out our preprint, which you can easily get to using that QR code or come by my poster on the topic. Thank you.